Uh, we left off Act 1, Scene 2, with Claudius addressing Hamlet. This is line 59, nope, uh, 64, I believe. <clears throat> he says, but now my cousin Hamlet and my son, and I think I mentioned, um, your gloss points out that the word cousin can just refer to any extended family member. It's just not part of the nuclear family, not son or daughter, not brother, sister, mother, father. So it's anything, any family relation beyond that or outside that. So cousin, family relation, and then much more narrow, much more specified, and my son. Hamlet gives an aside, a little more than kin and less than kind. Now, I think I mentioned this the other day, but I'll go over it briefly. An aside is not heard by the people on the stage. An aside is only heard by the people in the audience. <clears throat> An aside, however, is not the same as a soliloquy because a soliloquy occurs when the speaker is alone on the stage, all right? An aside occurs when there are obviously other people there. So Hamlet's little aside is a little more than kin and less than kind. So. A little more than kin. Your gloss tells you, my relation to you has become more than kinship warrants. That may or may not be. What it means is we are more than just extended family. Okay? We're a lot closer relationship than that. And less than kind means, and now that relationship is unnatural. In Hamlet's first soliloquy, the second half of it is all going to be, is going to be entirely about the unnaturalness of it, okay? The incestuousness of it. So less than kind means both unnatural and it does mean unkind, not nice. Hamlet says, not, not so, my lord, I am too much in the sun. And you've got a gloss there. I am too much out of doors, like I've got a tan, it's utterly asinine. I am too much in the sun of your grace, being ironic. I am too much of a son to you. It, no, no, it doesn't mean the first one or the third one. It's the second one. I am too much in the sun of your grace. Here's the sun. Here's the Earth's orbit. Way out here, you know, here's Jupiter's orbit. How do we see Jupiter? How do we see the moon? Because our ability to see the moon or to see Jupiter or Mars or Venus or any of the other planets is because of what? Is Jupiter giving off its own light? No, it's reflecting the light of the sun. Hamlet is playing on a medieval idea, Shakespeare, is playing on a medieval idea that the king or monarch, queen, in, his, in Shakespeare's case, the king or queen is the son of the state or of the nation. The state or nation gets its glory from that individual. What Hamlet is saying is, I am too physically close to you. Where is Hamlet normally, apparently? The king's going to give a long speech. And at the end of the speech, he's going to say, we don't want you to go back to Wittenberg. Hamlet's normally a student at university. Not in the town of Elsinore, but in the town of Wittenberg in Germany. Hamlet is saying, of late, I've been too much in your presence. Okay? When the king asks, how is it the clouds still hang upon you? What is he talking about? Again, he's using a metaphor. The clouds are what? It's not clear yet. It's going to be clear because of what his mother is going to say about Hamlet's appearance, his clothing, and then what Hamlet says about them. But we can infer that clouds implies something about Hamlet's attitude. He's kind of down. He's kind of depressed. 
So, queen. Good Hamlet, cast thy knighted color off. He's wearing black. And let thine eye look like a friend on Denmark. On Denmark here doesn't refer to the state or the country. It refers to the king. Denmark is used to refer just to the king. Just as at times Norway will be used just to refer to the king of Norway. Do not forever with thy veiled lid seek for thy noble father in the dust. Thou knowest his common. All that lives must die. Passing through nature to eternity. So, what does she mean by his veiled lids? And notice it's not V-E-I-L-E-D. -E -E. When Hamlet walks around, she tells us, he looks with his veiled lids, what? For his father in the dust. His eyes are on the ground. Everywhere he goes, he's just looking down. Remember Parson Hooper, we were told, was a meditative person whose eyes were often on the ground. Deep in thought. She's taking that deep in thought to mean Hamlet is looking for his father. It's not like he's literally turning under rocks and stones trying to find dear old dad. The veil of lids are not because he walks around with his eyes closed. It's because when somebody else comes towards him and Hamlet's like this, he can't see the eyeballs or he can see the eyelids. Okay. Thou knowest tis common. What's the tis? Apostrophe T I S. It's an abbreviated form for it is, but it's not pronounced with two syllables. It's pronounced with one syllable. What is common? Death. How common is death? all experience it. That's about the most common thing you can get. Okay, All that lives must die, <coughs> passing through nature to eternity. That is, everything that lives goes through two states. It goes through this state, the state of nature, the state of physical being, to eternity. Nature exists within time, Outside nature exists outside of time. Eternity, outside time, is what that word literally means. It doesn't mean immortal. Immortal means not dying. Eternal means never, uh, means being outside time, no beginning, no end. Okay? He says, I, tis common. you gloss. It is common, but it hurts nevertheless. That's, that's not what it means. There's nothing in that line that is suggesting Hamlet is saying, yes, it's common, but it still hurts, Mommy. He's just acquiescing. You're right. It is common. Everything that lives dies. Then why is it so particular to you? I'm going to rephrase that because I used the wrong verb. Why seems it so particular to you? Seems, appears. What is she saying? Why does death seem, come across as particular? What death? There's only been one death referred to. Hamlet seems. Why is your father's death so particular to you? It's rather an asinine question when you think about it. Why is your father's death affecting you so personally? Put yourself in Hamlet's shoes. How, how long has, Claudia, uh, has Hamlet Sr. been dead? Hamlet's first soliloquy? He's going to say it's within, within a month. That is, it's less than a full month. Another point in the play, we're going to hear it's two months. Another point, we're going to hear it's four months. So it's somewhere between under four and a half weeks to eight weeks. Uh, excuse me, 12 weeks. Okay? Seems 
Notice, he doesn't pick up on the particular part. He picks up on the seem part. But why does it seem so particular to Hamlet? Because it was his particular father. That's why I said, put yourself in Hamlet's shoes. Let's assume for a moment it is too much. We don't know in Hamlet's age yet. We will find out in Act 5 if we're careful readers. And it's probably going to surprise you. But let's assume he's a teenager. And his father has been dead now for two months. And assume he had a loving relationship with his father. You think he's done with it? He's done? That's it? Over? Mm, probably not. And mom is saying, suck it up, son. Seems? Nay, it is. That is, it is particular with me. I know not seems. Because what is seems? It is a I don't have it written down. It is a subjunctive verb. It indicates condition contrary to fact. The condition contrary to fact is that it appears particular. He's saying, no, it is particular. Why? Hamlet was Hamlet Sr.'s only son. Hamlet Sr. was Hamlet Jr.'s only father. Uh, until <laughs> four weeks ago months ago, whatever. Tis not alone my inky cloak, good mother. Why does he say good mother? Because she said good Hamlet. In other words, he's being a smart ass. Tis not alone my inky cloak, good mother, nor customary suits of solemn black, that is the normal clothing I wear, which is black. Why? It's solemn. It is the color you wear when you are in mourning. Queen Victoria, if I remember correctly, after Prince Albert, Prince Consort, died, she wore black for a year. She went into, and because the queen wore the colors of mourning, the state was in mourning for a year. All right? When Prince Philip died, Queen Elizabeth's husband, she didn't wear black for a year. I think she wore black for something like 40 days. And then she went back to her bright normal colors. Okay. So it's not the customary suits of solemn black, nor windy suspiration of forced breath, sighs. If you've ever known someone who's gone through a horrible situation, who's lost somebody, etc., there's a lot of sighing going on. It's like they can't catch their breath. No, nor the fruitful river in the eye, tears, nor the dejected hanger of the visage, walking around just always looking sorrowful, the frown. Together, that is, all of these things, with all forms, moods, shapes of grief, that is, forms of grief, moods of grief, shapes of grief, that can be no mutually. None of these things, and he uses the term denote. When we get to poetry, one of the words, one of the phrases, or two of the words that are going to show up in the, you know, talking about technical terms and stuff, are denotations and connotations. What are denotations? The shirt, other than the images on it, it's blue. That's a color, right? That's the dictionary definition for the word blue. It can also have what connotations? Sad, mournful, I'm blue today, you know, dog died, whatever. <clears throat> he says none of these things denote me truly. They don't reveal the real me. Why? Because these, these indeed seem, they are action that a man might play. If you remember, right, if you remember the other day I had up here, you know, watching, observing, spying, and then I also put acting, pretending. It's one of the major, it's a major image used in the play. Pretending, okay, disguising. Shakespeare loves that, by the way. He uses it in a lot of plays. They are actions that a man might play, but I have that within which passeth show. 
I've got something in me that he's saying what? Can't be pretended. Can't be played out. No, no, no. He says, these, these are but the trappings and the suits, the outward appearances of woe. What is it that he has within? Woe, mourning, sorrow. What is Hamlet? just obliquely told us. What should his mother have heard? He's hurting. He's, you know, <laughs> if he'd been in battle, we'd say, Hamlet's suffering PTSD. And in one sense, he is. So the king, hears Hamlet's speech, and he picks up on it. He understands, a little bit at least, of what Hamlet is saying. Tis sweet and commendable in your nature, Hamlet, to give these morning duties to your father. Well done. This is how a son ought to mourn his father. Until you get that word that never comes out good, right? You're out with a significant other, and you think the relationship's going great, and you say those words, I love you, and the other one says something, but what's the but always do? It's like a dagger to the heart, okay? The but is always the killer. But you must know that is intellectually, not in the heart, intellectually, your father lost a father. That is, your father lost your grandfather. That father lost your grandfather, lost his grandfather, your great-grandfather. And the survivor bound to filial obligation for some term to do obsequious sorrow. That is, when a son loses his father, it is that son's duty to mourn for the father. The term obsequious here, line 90-something, 90 92, here it means, your gloss says it means dutiful. It's not what it means. Obsequious means full of mourning. There were poems written. Uh, I did my dissertation on a, a Renaissance poet who wrote a bunch of poems that are called obsequies. These obsequies are these remembrances of various people's deaths. He wrote death poems for various important people, celebrating their lives, right? but at the same time, mourning their loss for the world and such. So to do obsequious, mournful duties, sorrow. But, again, to persevere, we would say persevere, but to persevere in obstinate condolement is a course of impious stubbornness. Obstinate condolement, condolement, sorrowing. You find out, you know, someone has had a relative die, and you send a card that says, or an email, my condolences on your loss. That means, I feel for you. For some of us, we can say, been in your shoes, I know what it's like. But this is what kind of condolences? Obstinate. What does obstinate mean? Pig-headed. Can't even be border on wrong-headed. This is condolences that go too far. Not too far in the sense of expressing sorrow, but holding on to the sorrow. Is a course of impious stubbornness. What is impious? Is there a gloss down there for that? I don't think there is. Nope. Unpious. What's pious? Proper devotion to God. Proper relationship to God. This is unpious. This goes against God. This goes against what God wants us to show in terms of sympathy for someone who's lost a loved one. And then he just kind of pulls out 
all the stops. So we've been told it's obstinate sorrows and it is impious stubbornness. Now tis unmanly grief. What has he just told Hamlet? He's being like. Quit acting like a woman, Hamlet. You know, the old stereotype, women are much easier to, you know, tears and all that. <clears throat> tis unmanly grief. Man up, grow a pair. It shows a will most incorrect to heaven. That is, how does the Lord's Prayer, how does Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane end? Thy will be done, not mine. This is showing will, F you, God, to heaven. A heart unfortified. So if the heart is unfortified, it means you lack what? What modern word do we use, it can be a noun or an adjective, to describe something about the heart? Courage. Courage. Okay? Unbrave. You're a coward, Hamlet. So he's called him a girl, and now he says, you're weak. A mind impatient, impatient, unwilling to suffer. An understanding simple, that is, you're a damn fool. And unschooled. Why is his mind unschooled? Hamlet is a university student at the University of Wittenberg, one of the oldest universities in Germany. How is he, how is he unschooled then? What has he not learned? I don't know if you've ever read it. Pick up some time, look on the internet, for uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson's Amer The American Scholar. That and Self-Reliance, two essays he wrote. One of them was for the opening of Harvard one year, like the commencement address. <clears throat> In, I think it's The American Scholar, he draws a distinction between two kinds of learning. Anybody know what they are? This, book learning, and the real world. In fact, I'm pretty sure it was that one, because he's addressing incoming students, as well as the students who are currently there at Harvard. And he essentially tells them, ditch this, ditch Harvard, and go out and live. Experience the real world. That's where the real learning comes from. Claudius is saying Hamlet hasn't learned what the world has to teach. What's one of the things the world teaches? This is one of the values of, as parents, having your children have pets. Forces them to learn what? Dealing with loss. Dealing with loss. How do you deal with death? Okay? For what we know must be and is as common as any the most vulgar thing to sense, why should we in our peevish opposition take it to heart? What is the thing that is as most common? It's death. He's saying, why should we take death to heart? I, I used the image in my class yesterday. It's a longer class, so I have a little bit more time. <coughs> Compared myself with my siblings. I've got four older siblings, about when my parents died. I'm here in Tennessee. They were all out at the time on the West Coast. I hadn't seen my parents very much, maybe once every other year for the last 20 years. Sometimes it was once every three years, okay? So I'd seen them, you know, before my mom died, maybe five times in seven to 10 years. So when she died, it didn't affect me nearly as much as those who lived within 30 miles because they didn't see her all the time. And they saw her go from normal state to Alzheimer's and all that kind of stuff. I saw her when I would go out the last three years of her life and you know, she didn't know who I was. Literally did not know who I was kind of a thing. So it didn't affect me like it did them. Why? It's not that I have this peevish, you know, all that. 
I, in my mind, she'd already gone. They, however, had this ongoing sorrow. And some of them still, you know, the day of her death comes up and, oh, I saw I miss mom. And I'm like, I know, you know, sorry, I just, I don't really miss her because I didn't see her that much before. So he says, da, 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 da. Tis a fault to heaven, a fault against the dead. That is, it's wrong against heaven. It is wrong against the one who has died. And it is wrong against nature. And it is absurd. It doesn't make any sense, Hamlet, to reason. What? Whose common theme is death of fathers. And who still have cried from the first course. Corpse? Remember the other day I had written corpse? You know, and corpse and such. And said, you know, the word corpse refers to a dead body. To, to, what was the first course? It's not an accident that he uses this. He, Shakespeare, not he, Claudius. I think it is an accident that Claudius uses this image. What was the first corpse? Abel. Killed by his brother. Claudius, we're going to find out very shortly. So what does he say? Hamlet, I don't want you to go back to Wittenberg. I want you to stay here. Why? Be as a son, he says to me. We pray you throw to earth this unprevailing woe and think of us as of a father. Your father's alive. It's me now. Forget Hamlet Sr. And then he throws one other thing into the, into the mix. For let the world take note, you are the most immediate to our throne. You're next in line, Hamlet. See, I don't think that works the way he intends for it to work. For one simple reason. I think Hamlet thinks, when he hears that, it should be my throne. According to the law of primogeniture, eldest son inherits the throne. Not king's brother. This goes, you know, the, the history of the English monarchy in the Middle Ages is all about this problem. Because you have a brother killing off the brother's eldest sons. So that he ends up being the one inheriting the brother. It's, you know, again, the line changing. I think when Hamlet hears that, he's like, I should be the one on the throne. Okay? So, stay here. The queen says, Hamlet, please, I'm begging you. He says, I shall in all the best obey thee, madam. The king says, that's a great reply. Everybody leaves but Hamlet. Hamlet gets his first soliloquy. And it's a doozy. I mean, it is And it tells us something about, obviously, Hamlet's inner self, his true thoughts. Because what the soliloquy is, really, it's the verbal playing out, it's the acting, the portraying of what the character in the play really, truly thinks. It, it, we're just taking inside the person's mind, right? So look at what he really, truly thinks. Oh, that this too, too sullied flesh would melt, fall, and resolve itself into a dew. Or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. Okay? Let's go back to the first line. So, first, what's he talking about? The, the second two lines betray it. Or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon, his laws, his rules, against what? Self-slaughter. Self-slaughter is the English translation of what Latin word? Suicide. If only God hadn't outlawed suicide. Now, who says that? Someone who wants to go murder somebody? No. <laughs> Someone who wants to contemplate suicide. Who wants to kill him or herself? So back up. Oh, that this tutu sullied flesh. Okay? Sullied is the earlier reading 
in the publication history of Shakespeare's plays. I'd written up here on the board Monday, Hamlet, 1600. 1600 is the year the play is first performed. It's first published in 1603. Then I'm pretty sure there's another publication, can't remember the date off the top of my head, and then it gets published again in the first folio of 1623. But in the first folio, the word that here and in the earlier publication is sully is now solid. So read it with the solid. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew. Well, solid and solid are two different words. They are not related at all. They're totally opposite. No, take that back. They're not totally opposite, they're totally different. So which one's right? Or are they both right? Does the solid represent Shakespeare's attitude at one point and solid represents a later attitude? Possible. My dissertation was um, in the branch of English studies called textual criticism, textual editing. You get a, a bunch of text of a certain, a bunch of versions of a certain text and you try to figure out which one's the earliest and or which one best represents the author's intentions. And so in that, there is a textual principle called, usually just this part is used, Lectio Difficilior, Latin. All it means is the more difficult reading. The rest of it is Lectio Difficilior Potior. That is, the more difficult reading is the stronger, meaning the better. So if you have two readings, and one of them is a lot harder to understand, that is probably what the author intended. Because authors don't intend all the time to be perfectly clear, okay? So how can you get this, for example, being this reading? Because that's what most scholars think. This is the harder reading. Well, think of the second part of the line. Would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a do, or do you? It's easy to see how something solid could do that. If I had stuck this in the freezer overnight and I brought it in this morning, it'd be a bottle full of ice. And we could sit over the next 45 minutes and watch it slowly melt, thaw. And then if I brought in a Bunsen burner with a pot, poured the water in that, put a lid on the pot with a coil of tubing, what would happen to that water when it started to boil? turns into water vapor, right? And what happens when it hits that coil? Condenses, that's what, you know, it's how you make brandy and whiskey and bourbon and all that good stuff. And it distills, and when it comes out of that tubing, what is it? What is distilled water? It's pure. It has no impurities. It has no imperfections. It is unsullied. Sullied means stained, tainted, impure. And you can take that to its logical extension. Foul, raunchy, rotted. Oh, that this too, too, foul, raunchy, rotted, stained, corrupted, what? Flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve, be reformed into a dew. Meaning, not turning the body into a little bead of pure water, but refining, purifying the body, restoring the body. Christian idea, resurrection. The body the way the body was meant to be, okay? Pretty important difference between that and just solid. You take something solid and you make it, you know, pure but they both work. This probably came from somebody copying a manuscript and they saw the word sullied, but it wouldn't necessarily have been spelled like this. In Shakespeare's day, there were no standards for spelling. People spelled according to how they spoke. And I've seen manuscripts, I used to work with a lot of Renaissance manuscripts, I've seen instances where Sully is not spelled exactly like this, but is close. Sometimes it had an E, sometimes it didn't have an E. Sometimes it has one L, sometimes it has two Ls. But look at the difference between this and this. If 
you had to write papers for me, I would write comments and send it back, and I could bet you 50% of the time my O's look like U's because I don't connect it at the top. Solid, solid, okay? Or that the everlasting had not fixed his can against self-slaughter. The first one is talking about just dying and being what? Remade, resurrected purely, so to speak. The second is about, I want to off myself. How weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. If you've ever known someone, which hopefully you haven't, hopefully you never will, if you've, never, if you've ever known someone who's suicidal, that describes their attitude. This world sucks and then you die. There's nothing, there's no light at the end of the tunnel. It's just a tunnel. And it's not a tunnel, it's a pit. And you don't hit bottom. That's why they kill themselves. They can't see any light. They can't see any profit. They can't see any taste. They can't see any texture. All those are the opposites of weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable. We wouldn't say fi on it today. We'd say F it. Tis an unweeded garden. Shakespeare loves that image of the world or England as a garden. But this is an unweeded garden. What happens to a garden that is unweeded? What happens to the plants you plant in that garden? They die. Why? Because the weeds overtake them. And it's an unweeded garden that does what? It grows to seed. That is, the plants, the vegetables and flowers you put in, those don't grow to seed. That is, those don't put out seeds that produce more like them. It's the weeds that put out seed. And then more weeds grow. And more weeds grow. Until we get to the world that Hamlet inhabits now. Why does he use garden? Garden of Eden. And the world has become what since the Garden of Eden? This world. The things rank and gross in nature possess it merely. Okay? You gloss completely, entirely. What are the things rank? Uh, and gross in nature. I think he's talking about a person. What possesses the world of Elsinore? It's not Hamlet. It's his stepfather. That it should come to this. But two months dead. But there means only. Only two months. Nay, not so much. Not two. So it's not been two months, it's been all those two months, but then later on, he's gonna go on and he's gonna say, it's not even been a month. That what? So excellent a king that was to this Hyperion to a satyr. So when he says that was to this, what does he, what does he mean? What's the this? Who is Hyperion and who is the satyr? His father was Hyperion, the sun god. In the Olympian realm, uh, excuse me, in the Olympian reign of the gods, Apollo was the sun god, Venus. In the Titanic reign of the gods, when the Titans reigned, okay, Hyperion was the sun god. The Titans were overthrown by the Olympians. Right? He's saying, my father was like Hyperion. He doesn't say to this Apollo, this upstart, you know, this usurper. Uh -uh. My father was like Hyperion to, and when he says to this, I think what Hamlet should do is he should point to where Claudius had been standing. Direct the audience's attention. Because notice, Claudius isn't there now. 
So he's comparing two things that aren't there, kind of, to this, what? Satyr. What's a satyr? Half man, half goat. Claudius isn't even, in Hamlet's mind, Claudius isn't even fully human. He's half beast. And notice, half goat, not half lion, like a sphinx. Head of a man, body of a lion. I mean, you can kind of go, oh, that's pretty cool. You know, it's fierce and we'll defend. It's a goat. Goats are the symbol of lechery throughout the Middle Ages and Renaissance. Well, even back to Roman times. Okay? And the satyr would have the body of a goat, would walk on its hind legs, okay? would have arms of a man, and the head and upper torso of a man. So everything here down, okay, essentially goat-like, and would have a goat's horns. The horns are the symbol of cuckoldry, okay, of being a cuckold and of being sexually promiscuous. So loving to my mother, that is my father, this Hyperion, was so loving to my mother that he would between the winds of heaven not to blow her hair out. He, he, He'd go outside and say, all right, when stop. Gertrude's about to come forth, you know. Must I remember? She would hang on him as if increase of appetite had grown by what it fed on. And yet, within a month, oh, I can't take it out. Frailty, thy name is woman. Why? I'm saying she's weak. Weak how? She's not a self-assertive woman. She doesn't realize what she can do. Possibly. I think the wheel, the wheelty, the frailty is referring to something else. Sexually is what he's alluding to. Because what we're going to find out when we get down to the end of the speech, what is bothering him? Incestuous sheets. Let me not think on it. Frailty, thy name is woman. A little month, or ere those shoes were old, with which she followed my foot. Within a month. What? The shoes that she wore to follow my body, my father's body to his grave, she wore to her wedding. Metaphorically, not literally, he's saying what? She didn't even have a time to change. Like the you know minister's black veil, she buried dead body in the afternoon, and she got married in that evening. A beast at once that is lax reason would have mourned longer. Married with my uncle, my father's brother, but no more like my father than I to Hercules. Within a month. Before the tears could even dry on her face, she got married. Oh, most wicked speed to post with such dexterity to incestuous sheets. You've got a gloss for dexterity. Facility. Does that help? No. What does dexterity mean? Agility. To post. That means to move to. How quickly did she jump into the bed with incestuous sheets before you could say jump? <clears throat> and the idea of the agility, the dexterity, is like she's a women's gymnast champion. She can bend her body all kinds of which ways. Which makes a lot of readers, a lot of critics, look at this and go, oh, I know what Hamlet's problem is. Hamlet's problem, go back to Oedipus, Hamlet's problem, or Electra, Hamlet's problem is he wants to be the one jumping in bed with his mother. Okay? It cannot, it is not, nor it cannot come to good. This isn't good. Moreover, this is going to have negative consequences. This bodes ill for the state. But break my heart. Hold my tongue. 
Why must he hold his tongue? Who's he going to talk to about this? Who's he going to say, you know, I think there's something funny about my mom marrying my uncle so quickly. So that part's kind of easy. What about the break my heart? Why must his heart break? What do therapists tell people who are going through hard times? What, what should you do? Or counselors or priests or whatever. They'll say, hit it off your chest. <clears throat> Meaning, get it out. Because what will it do otherwise? What will all those negative thoughts do? They turn what should be a garden, your heart, into an unweeded and rank garden because those negative thoughts are like the weed and they will strangle, they will choke out what good there is. <clears throat> Horatio Marcellus and Bernardo come in. And Hamlet says, what are you doing, Horatio? Why aren't you at Wittenberg? Horatio is Hamlet's schoolfellow at Wittenberg. He said, oh, I'm just a truant, you know, I'm a truant, and he goes, no, 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 <laughs> don't lie. Why are you really here? Uh, I came to see your father's funeral. Prithee, I do not, uh, I prithee, I pray thee, don't lie. You came here to see my mother get married. So, Horatio, I, I came to pay respects. Don't lie to me, you came to see my mother get married. Notice Horatio's response. <laughs> Indeed, my Lord. It followed hard upon. In other words, you're right. I can kill two birds with one stone. How quickly should one get married, remarried, after one spouse dies? Should it be within a month? <laughs> Not usually. Because that usually implies... One is already lined up before the other one is cold and dead in the ground. Thrift, thrift, Horatio. Notice Hamlet says, you're right. Why? Because they had the table all set out for the after the burial wake, the meal for the surviving family, condole, all that kind of stuff. And they thought, hey, you know, we can just have the wedding later on and use the same food metaphorically Hamlet is talking about, okay? And then Hamlet says, methinks I see my father. Where, my lord? If I were directing, and I think I've only seen this done maybe once. If I were directing, when Hamlet says that, Horatia goes, where? Why? Because he saw him just the night before. In my mind's eye, I saw him once. It was a good looking Hamlet. He's a man. Take him for all in all. I think I saw him. Saw who? My lord, your, the king, your father. The king, my father. What were Claudius' words to Hamlet? Take me as a father. You shall be like a son. Hamlet wants to make sure they're talking about the same father. Horatio, shh, 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 calm down. Season your admiration. That is, get patient, get some time, patience. He said, we'll tell you. So Horatio relates the story of what he saw the night before and what Bernardo and Marcella saw the two nights before that also. Okay. They ask where, he asked where, did you speak to it? They said, we tried, etc. And what did he look like? Hamlet says, do you have the watch tonight? We do, okay. And he was armed, they said, yep, head to foot. Uh, do you see his face? Yep, his beaver, the part of the helmet that goes down over the face was pulled up. Did, how did he look? Pale, he looked pale. Did he look you in the eyes? No, bored into our eyes, okay. Beard, the whole nine yards. Hamlet says, I'm gonna keep watch with you tonight. If it assume my noble father's person to 40 something, I'll speak to it. Notice, assume. What does that mean? If it 
takes the form of my father. If it appears as my father. We could even use the word that Horatio uses to the ghost. What art thou that usurpst this time of night and the fair and warlike form? If it usurps my father's form, I'll speak to it. Though hell itself should gape and bid me hold my peace. That is, hell should open its mouth before me and say, silence. Hamlet's like, the hell with it. We already been told he's considering what? Self-slaughter. Don't tell anybody what you've seen. Okay? So Hamlet says, I'll meet you between 11 and 12. They all leave. My spirits, my father's spirit and arms, all is not well. What does all is not well mean? Things are effed up. And it means all Nothing is as it should be. I doubt, I expect, some foul play. Oh, I wish the night would come. Till then, sit still, my soul. Why does he have to tell his soul to sit still? The peace. Break my heart. His soul is doing what? It's like that pot of water I was talking about. It's just bubbling. He's going, down boy, down. <laughs> Foul deeds will rise, though all the earth overwhelmed in two men's eyes. There's an old medieval notion, to use the phrase Chaucer uses, murder will out. Murder will reveal itself. And the implication is, and this is you know, the basis of all crime shows, is that criminals are stupid. And they'll do something that gives a clue or hint to enable the cops to find them, okay? Scene three, got four minutes left, not even four. We're in Polonius' home. Polonius is the chief advisor of the scene. He's got two children, Laertes, the eldest, and Ophelia. Laertes is getting ready to go back off to university in Paris, and he talks to Ophelia, and he asks her about her relationship with Hamlet. And he tells her to don't take anything Hamlet says or does seriously. And she says, no more but so? And he says, yes, why? And he talks about Hamlet's nature. And that as his nature grows, what? His mind will grow with that. And he will start to think about bigger things than just himself. Meaning, right now, Hamlet is let's say, infatuated with you. But as he grows older, what will he have to start thinking about? More than just Ophelia. He'll have to start thinking about things like the kingdom. Why? He's next in line. What's he telling Ophelia? Honey, sis, Hamlet can't marry you. Great Britain changed the laws between the time when Prince Charles got married, 1981, 83, something like that, and when his eldest son, William, got married. Charles had to marry someone with royal blood. He could not marry the woman he loved at the time. He is now married to her. I can't remember. I think she was divorced. Camilla, uh, he couldn't marry her then. Why? It was literally against the law for the king to marry, or future king, to marry a divorcee. Ancient law, most famously had its biggest effect in the 1930s, 1936, I think it was, when King Edward the, I said the fourth in my earlier class, but King Edward the sixth, I think it was, no, Edward the Eighth, or Seventh, whatever, in the 1930s fell in love with an American widower named Wallace Simpson, uh, excuse me, an American divorcee, 
named Wallace Simpson. Madly in love with her. Wanted to marry her. Family said no. Prime Minister said no. You can't. The law's against it. And he gave up the throne. He abdicated. And his younger brother, George, became George VI. George had two daughters, Elizabeth and Margaret. Elizabeth became queen in 53, right? Well, Charles loved a divorcee between when he married Princess Diana and when he married Camilla, 2010, something like that, Parliament changed the law. <laughs> and when William married Kate Middleton, he didn't have to marry someone with royal blood. Kate Middleton, Kate Middleton has, you know, she's a commoner, a total commoner, okay? So he gives her all these rules. If you give up your virginity to Hamlet, he's going to take it, and you're still not going to marry him, all right? She says, okay, and I know it's time to go. She says, okay, but just you remember this. Don't give me the thorny and hard road to paradise, heaven, ultimately, while you tread, as she puts it, the primrose path of dalliance. What's she talking about? Don't give me this double standard. Don't tell me I can't have sex. When you're gonna go off to Paris, you know, the city of love, and just, you know, sow your wild oats, so to speak. And he's like, oh, no, 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 you don't have to worry about me. Not at all. Okay, we will stop there. And we did not get nearly as far as we needed to. Um, and we're gonna pick up with line 55 when Polonius addresses Laertes and starts giving him his famous advice. At least have through Act Two uh, finished for Friday. Okay, why are you not?